Okay, if you're a new mom, an expecting mom, a grandma, a nanny, or anyone who will be in contact with a newborn, you're going to want to listen to this episode. I started following my next guest on Instagram when I saw a bunch of local moms tagging her and singing her praises for newborn help. I knew I wanted her as a guest because so many times I'll see her post things and think, man, I wish I knew her back when I was having babies. Rachel Ramsey, a former neonatal registered nurse, is the founder of The Newborn Nurse, which she began after realizing that moms really needed the most support in the days and weeks after leaving the hospital. She has worked for over 21,000 hours at the bedside of moms and babies and has taken care of over 11,000 newborns. So yes, I think that qualifies her as an expert. We talk about everything from preparing to have a baby, having the baby, what you need for the hospital and what you need for your nursery. We talk about the first days at home and how others can support a brand new mom. I ask her about her favorite must have items for a newborn and most importantly, how to get some sleep. Rachel and her team offer in-home services here in town, but she also has a wildly popular online course for preparing to bring your newborn home. She is full of great advice, and I'm happy to bring it to you in this episode. So without further ado, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with the newborn nurse, Rachel Ramsey. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Today, I'm so excited. I have Rachel Ramsey here, and Rachel is from The Newborn Nurse, which people might recognize from following you (laughs) on Instagram, which is how I found you, someone just posting about using your services. And I was like, wait, what is this magical (laughs) service, a newborn nurse that comes to my house or, or helps me navigate the newborn years? So I'm so thankful you're here today and answering all of our questions for first-time moms, second-time moms, anyone with a newborn, grandma, uh, taking care of a newborn or even a caretaker. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Yay. So So. can you tell us just a little bit kind of like about yourself and how you even became the newborn nurse? Yes. So I am a Nashville native, one of the few, born and raised. the unicorn, (laughs) Nashville unicorn. Yes. Um, And I went to UT Knoxville and graduated from their nursing school program in 2005. So I've been a nurse for 18 years. And my entire career, I have cared for moms and babies. I went straight into labor and delivery. Then I worked in the Well Baby Nursery, NICU, postpartum. So I've cared for moms and babies my entire career. And in the hospital, when I worked there, when we are discharged, charging moms from the hospital out to their car to go home, Mm -hmm. we would have to walk them out the door with their newborn. (laughs) The scariest time ever. (laughs) It was like, you know, the, you know, the doom walk. And so I would walk them out to their cars and they would look at me, look at the baby, (laughs) like, you got to send me home with this little baby. What do I do? And nowadays in the hospital, you're there for two or three days Mm -hmm. and they kind of kick you out the door. And so after doing this for so many years, I just had this burden on my heart. I was like, moms need help at home, even Mm -hmm. just for like a few days or just a week or a few weeks just to kind of get their sea legs, recover from delivery, maybe get some more breastfeeding help. Um, I just had this this again, burden on my heart for this. So years go by of of doing this. And one day I just sat down on my computer and Googled how to start a business and started my business from the ground up in order to help moms at home. Um, We are now six years old. I have a team of 26 neonatal RNs. So we do in-home care for moms and newborn education, but basically it all came from walking moms out of the hospital doors and uh, realizing that they needed extra help. I love help. that you recognize that from a nurse perspective, because you hear women often say like, you're getting wheeled to the car and you keep thinking, there's no way they're letting me leave. Like I am not qualified to do this. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's interesting that from the, p- the person pushing the wheelchair, yes, you could see that like fear take over Take yes. over. Was there anyone in Nashville doing anything like that? I don't think at the time I did a little research because I didn't even know that this existed either until I kind of started Googling yeah. it. And I knew in bigger cities like New York, LA, they have uh, businesses like mine, but I didn't at the time know of anything in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And I think there are a few like mine now in this area, but it's been a pretty new concept here in the yeah. Nashville area. So you decide you're going to start a business and th- did you quit your job or you're still working? Um, I do now. I do not work in the hospital okay. anymore, but for a couple of years, I was still there and mm-hmm. kind of starting my business, okay. but now I'm doing this full time. And how did you go about getting clients? 
it just kind of all started with word of mouth. I started with one client and like two or three nurses and the word got out, as you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) people started talking saying, you can get help with your baby. You can get a nurse to come to your house and help you. So it just slowly grew. um, But we have an Instagram presence, but I would say word of mouth has been the biggest, the biggest help for us. Do you do, is it primarily more in home, like spend, spend the night? You can spend the night at somebody's house, correct? Yes. So we offer two services. The first service we we offer is the in-home nursing care. And so what that is, is we have a neonatal registered nurse. Mm -hmm. So you have a hospital nurse who's worked in the nursery or NICU. They come to your house. We have daytime care or nighttime care, but most of our care is the nighttime care Mm -hmm. because moms need sleep. Sleep. So we come over, we take over care of the newborn, the mom goes to sleep, and my goal is for her to get as much rest as possible. And we work on sleep training. So we try to stretch that baby at night to get them longer stretches of sleep. We can do baby laundry, dishes, clean breast pump parts, help with oh breastfeeding. Gosh. So moms wake up and are as rested as possible and they're able yeah. to function. And if they have other kids, be present for the other kids. Um, so it's a great investment in mental yeah. health and recovery. And, and again, I've done this almost 20 years. And with our clients, I've just seen they just bounce back so much faster. They, You hear them say they thrive and they actually really enjoy the newborn mm. um, time instead of just kind of surviving. So. Well, and I think there's such a gift to in them not fearing that they're doing it wrong. Like exactly. someone else to say, no, you're fine. And they just get to enjoy it versus that yes. fear of, did the baby eat enough? Or is they, are they sleeping enough? Yes. Yeah. And also with online and with Instagram and Google and all the things, I think a lot of moms nowadays have information overload. They don't know mm-hmm. where to turn. They're hearing this from this friend, this from uh, their mom, this yeah. from this site. It's They don't know. They are so paralyzed with anxiety with, what do I do? I, th- I think it's really nice to have one expert like me, for example, or whoever they choose to say, I know you and your baby. Here's what you need to do in this situation yeah. instead of just being so overwhelmed with everything that they're getting from, from every other source. Right. Do you work with the family before they have the baby? Yes. Okay. So some of our clients do, um, we have a newborn education class, mm-hmm. which is wonderful. And it's most first-time parents choose that. And um, it is a month before their due date. We come to their home with a newborn baby doll and we go over everything about newborns they would ever want to know. It's a really intensive class. So um, swaddling, diapering, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, we go through all of their equipment, um, their car seat, oh, their baby bath. see what they have. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell them like, oh, you don't need this or you need more of this or you need fewer of this. So helps them kind of organize and troubleshoot all the things that they have yeah. purchased for their baby. Because I would go back to what you were saying, the information overload. Yes. I think like back when I was having babies, the information overload came from my mother, my mother's friends, my grandmother, my mother-in-law, the in-laws, all those women all had different opinions. And now I just cannot even imagine giving birth in the age of social media yes. and just all of the options. Yes. And I've been doing this again, like I've said, um, almost 20 years. And so I have seen it before internet. Yeah. <laughs> or, you yes, know, you and, have. Yeah. <laughs> and after internet. And the moms now, since the internet uh, or since social media, they just seem to be more anxious. Yes. And I can't help but think it has to be the comparison, uh, the comparison yeah. and all of the information mm-hmm. overload. Before then, I think moms were a little bit more laid yeah. back. <laughs> so. Well, and one of the questions I had had for you was uh, from a practical standpoint, and it actually made me think because I see so much on Instagram social media of new moms saying, see what I packed in my hospital bag. And it's like a whole thing. It's a whole reel. And sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, did you pack your entire (laughs) house? Like five (laughs) outfit changes and three different kinds of pumps and makeup and cameras and all that kind of stuff. If there is a mom who is getting ready to go to the hospital, who is not interested in all the fluff and is just like, what do I actually need in the hospital? Are there like some few, a few key items that Yes. You're like, yes, you need this. That's a great question. And I'm a minimalist because I think with a new baby, less is more. Mm-hmm. You already have enough going on. You're sleepless, yeah. you're, you're the hormones. So I think, again, less is more with a newborn. Um, and I actually made a little list of some extras. So the hospital will provide basics. So they provide... Um, 
you know, hospital gowns and towels in the bathroom and um, all the postpartum, you know, pads and panties. And they actually provide breast pumps as well. So they provide the their bare minimum basics. Yeah. Um, but I did make a list of some extras that a mom... Um, might want to bring with them. So for starters, when you deliver nowadays, you're in the hospital between two and four days. Mm -hmm. So you and your partner are both packing for about four days in the hospital. So you can bring a pillow, a blanket, try to make that room kind of your your home for a few days. Mm -hmm. Um, An extra long phone cord is helpful, your own snacks from home. You might want to bring a mini fan to stay cool because sometimes the hospital can get hot. You can actually make a music or song playlist for your delivery. Mm-hmm. You both will want to bring flip-flops or shower shoes because you oh, definitely do not want to yeah. stand barefoot in the hospital shower. Right. <laughs> um, comfy clothes, water bottle, hair dryer. They don't have hair dryers in the hospital. Um, toiletries. Those are just some basic extras you might want to bring. And then the rest, the hospital okay. covers everything I else. love that you said the phone cord. That You yes. know, that's the one that just stuck out to me because I'm yes. like, yes, these are practical little things that people are not maybe thinking about. Oh, and one other thing I yeah. just remember that one of my moms told me, a nightlight. They said a nightlight was helpful. Oh, so, yeah. So having to flip on all the really bright hospital lights. That's a great idea. Yes. Yeah, because otherwise they come in and it's just like those blazing, like halogen yes. lights. Okay. Do you think it's helpful to have your nursery set up before you give birth? Yes. You I do. think it's really nice to have a place to land when you come up from the mm-hmm. hospital, have everything ready to go, set up, organize. Um, I had a client recently and they had preemie, a preemie baby. And so they came home and it was kind of a whirlwind. They were still trying to set everything up and put the crib together. And Mm -hmm. I was there. So I think it's nice to well in advance, get everything ready to go. And that way you come home and you're just happy and you have a place to land when you come home from the hospital instead of having to frantically get everything ready. Yeah. And when you're just like, oh my gosh, my life is crazy. Do you have some key items you think are important? Like, is it important to have a full crib set up? Are we putting them in a crib from the beginning? Or is it like, I don't even know it's now. A great question. This is, is it a bassinet? Is it a swing? Yes. What most people do nowadays, um, they use a bassinet okay. for usually three to six months in their room. And actually the pediatric association recommends six months. But anyway, most people use a bassinet or a new type of bassinet called a snoo. I don't know if you've heard of that. I've heard the snoo. Okay. Yes. Yes. I've heard of the snoo. It's great. It actually kind of like- What's so good about it? So it actually has a sound machine built in and it kind of gently rocks your baby. And if they start to cry, it will rock them a little bit harder. So it actually puts them back to sleep if they start to fuss. Do they make them an adult size? I know, Adult adult size bed? (laughs) I've been asked that before. Um, and everyone swears by them. Yeah, they're I've wonderful, heard. especially with multiples. We have a lot of twin families, okay. and they're like, we literally would not survive without this. And you can just move it around the house. Yes. Okay. It is pretty heavy. The snoo is pretty big, but you can move that around. But anyway, um, most people use the bassinet or snoo, and then go to the crib later on down the road. But it's nice okay. to go ahead and have that set up and yeah. done. That way, it's checked off the list. Okay. Now you yes. said the pediatric recommended. Did you say? recommend a bassinet for six months or in your room for six months? Yes. So as of today, things change constantly, yes. but as of today, <laughs> it is um, a bassinet in the parent's room for six months. Wow. Is the, with the and going. what is, is there like, what is their reasoning behind that? Um, safety I guess, or? yeah, I guess for safety so you can hear and see your baby okay. if they need you at night. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Okay. Crib in the daytime for naps? No. So I am kind of laid back. I say just put them anywhere if you want to put them in the crib, in the bassinet. Um, but kind of moving into sleep training, one thing I am very, very particular about is starting day one home from the hospital with good sleep hygiene for a baby. Mm. Um, I'll get a mom who will call me and they'll have a three or four month old and the baby won't sleep well. And usually it's from starting bad habits early. Mm. So one thing you can do with a newborn is from day one, start with a sound machine and mm-hmm. a swaddle every time that they're asleep. Okay. So when your baby's asleep during the day and at night, you want to use the sound machine and the swaddle. And then when you wake them up for a feeding, you want to take them out of the swaddle, turn off the sound machine. Is that just like white noise in the sound machine or does it matter? Yes. White I noise. prefer white noise okay. and you want it pretty loud and you want it right next to the baby. You don't want it plugged up across the room. Okay. Um, and you'll start to notice over time that when you cut on that sound machine, they will automatically start to put themselves to sleep. Mm. So that's helpful to help. You know, I was in Target the, the other day and saw a dad and he had maybe a one or two month old in like the front baby carrier. Uh-huh. And there was a clip on sound machine yes. on the carrier and the baby was sound asleep. And I was like, what a genius idea. 
is it the little round gray yes. one? They have one that everybody's been using Yes. Now. Yeah. So those yeah. are wonderful. Okay. Yeah. I know. I was like, where were these? Yes. All right. <laughs> so All start, gadgets so starting, gadgets. okay. So walk me through, if I am a new mom and I'm coming home from the hospital for the very first time and I walk in and I just, <laughs> I, you stare at your husband, everyone's kind of looking at you. You're staring at the baby, waiting for them to wake up. Are there things, you've got the sound machine and the swaddle, but what are some of my first 24 to 48 hours yes. looking like? So that's a great question. Um, a lot of people do come in from the hospital and they're like, staring at each other like, yeah. now what? Yeah, <laughs> we have what do we do? Baby. Right. Yeah, so I think it's nice. Usually the first couple of days are kind of chaotic. You're getting settled into a routine. Mm -hmm. Usually there is an in-law or a mom or a dad there to kind of help out. Um, but usually it takes a day or two to kind of get settled, figure out where everything needs to go. Um, mom gets a, you know, bath or shower, baby gets a bath. Um, everybody kind of settles in. And then usually around day three or four, you can kind of start into more of a routine. Okay. And with our clients, we usually come in sometimes the day that they're home from the hospital mm -hmm. or within three to four days and yeah. kind of get them started on a good routine. Okay. So this is the age old question, the sleeping. Yes. You put the baby down to sleep. And I'm talking like first day, second day. I feel like I've heard a lot of different opinions on, are we waking them up to eat? Are we letting them sleep? Okay. So here's my opinion. So newborns need a certain amount of calories every 24 hours. Yeah. If you just step way back and look at the entire 24-hour day, your goal is you want them to take those calories in during the day and sleep more at night yeah. if at all possible. So what I prefer and what I recommend is during the day for a newborn, they need to feed about every three hours. They okay. feed very frequently. So during the day, you want to set an alarm. And even if your baby is asleep, you want to go ahead and wake them up at the three-hour mark. Mm -hmm. Example, let's say you fed last at 8 a.m., then you want to feed again at 11 a.m., so you're feeding every three hours during the day, which means then at night they can kind of spread out and sleep a little bit longer, sleep stretch, which in my opinion is between like three and four hours. Okay. Um, when they get a little older and with the pediatricians um, okay, they can sleep up to about five hours, but that's once the pediatrician gives the approval for that once they're gaining weight okay. um, and usually past their birth weight. Okay. So yeah. you still, you can't let them sleep too long. Because some babies will sleep a long time yeah. if you let them, right? If you let them, they'll sleep. Some of them will sleep seven, eight hours, you know, yeah. so you have to wake them up so they'll get their calories in. Okay. Yeah. And how are we in those first, I'm just focusing on the first couple of days right now. Yes. How do we ask our partners for help? That's a great question. Um, actually, just we were talking about this earlier. I just did a dad podcast mm -hmm. and we spoke to some new dads on how they can help their partner. Um, I think it's sometimes hard for a mom to ask for help and advocate yeah. for herself, but you just have to. You got to mm -hmm. put on your big girl panties and ask for help. Yeah. Um, you are your own and your baby's advocate. So just asking for help when needed. And then if you are the partner, I think it's super important. These two dads that I interviewed, they kept saying over and over that they learned to be proactive. So thinking mm -hmm. ahead, not asking, what do you need, honey? Right. Go ahead and doing it beforehand doing the dishes or um, if it's time for a feeding, what a lot of dads do if mama's breastfeeding is mom will go to the restroom, get herself ready for breastfeeding. The dad will maybe change the baby's diaper, mm -hmm. get mom some water and a snack, bring that over to her and kind of be extra hands. So anything to help facilitate as simple as that sounds, yeah. that's huge for a new yeah. mom. And I actually did an Instagram um, poll recently and asked, the new mom, asked our new moms what was the best thing that their partner did. And most of them said, bring me a snack. Mm. <laughs> Again, as simple as that yeah. sounds, they were just like, yeah. you brought me water and a yes. snack. That was so helpful. Yeah. So just we're down to basics with a newborn. Yeah. You're just surviving, you're eating, you're resting, you're sleeping, yeah. and just helping facilitate all of that is very yeah. helpful for a new mom. My husband used to say, your job is to take care of the baby and my job is to take care of you. Yeah. And it wasn't because he didn't want to take care of the baby. He just kept saying, I don't have what he needs. Like he does not want anything that I currently have. So, right. and I think too, especially if you are breastfeeding, you just need water all the time. Yes. And so someone to just kind of do that. Do you think there's a stigma attached to just new moms feeling like they have to do everything, like that they can't ask for help? I think so. And again, with social media, you yes. know, people have these reels of these fake pictures and that's not reality have been in a lot of people's homes yeah. and I don't care if you're, you know, a celebrity or not. Everybody is just in survival mode with a yeah. newborn. It's not shiny. It's not glamorous. 
you know, you're just, you're back to the basics. Mm -hmm. So, but again, asking for help, um, you know, and usually you need help before, you know, you need to ask for help before you think you do. Yeah. Kind of be proactive for mm-hmm. yourself as well. Yeah. So. What if we have people who are too helpful? Maybe a mother, maybe a mother-in-law, maybe an aunt. Yes. Uh, do you have clients who you feel like have maybe a little too much yes, unwanted Yes, it, it can help? happen. Um, and again, just being your own advocate, setting boundaries. Mm-hmm. One thing we do with my company is I can be the bad guy. Yes, you can. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm fine. We're not taking any visitors right now. <laughs> right. So I can be that buffer or a neutral person can be your yeah. buffer in your family to say, hey, we're good. You know, can you come back a little later? Mom's trying to rest. Mm-hmm. So if you can, again, find a neutral party to be the yeah. bad guy. <laughs> yeah. You can do that as well. One thing I feel like I hear a lot of people complaining about is people touching their babies. And that could even be family members that come mm-hmm. to visit. Do you kind of have a rule on what we should or shouldn't be letting yes. touch our Yes, that's a great babies? question. Um, my rule is you are your baby's gatekeeper, so you are mm-hmm. their protector. So don't feel bad to say, hey, go wash your hands. Right. Um, another thing you can do is you can have a big bottle of hand sanitizer sitting where people have to mm-hmm. use that first. Um, they actually also have a little stop sign. It's a, it's an actual stop sign. You can hang okay. on your baby's oh. car seat. Oh, so no I love one will that. And touch. Oh. Yeah. So, but again, just advocating for your child and just mm-hmm. saying, please, I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah. Remember like baby first and then right. you know, they're more important. So what, um, when moms come home from the hospital, we put so much emphasis on what does the baby need and how's the baby doing healthily and all that stuff. In terms of like physical recovery, what do moms need to be doing in those first, well, I mean, I have to say more than 48 hours, right? Weeks? Yes, first six, usually six to eight weeks. Okay. Um, I'm a huge advocate for self-care and rest and mm-hmm. sleep. Yeah. So for moms to get as much sleep as they possibly can um, with naps or again, whether it's hiring a night nurse or having their partner maybe switch and take a night for them, I have seen that moms do really, really well the more that they sleep Mm -hmm. and nutrition. Those two are just huge. Um, That's another thing that families should pre-plan for is for meals. So there are several companies here in Nashville that provide meals specific to postpartum moms. So the foods that they make will be helpful for lactation and have all the protein and all the nutrients that a new mom needs, but just making sure you're eating really healthy and eating frequently. Okay. If you're breastfeeding, you're going to be burning 500 more calories a day breastfeeding your Mm -hmm. baby, which is super exciting. Yeah. (laughs) For more calories. It's like your own little workout. Um, But again, sleep and nutrition and hydration Water. Are huge. Okay. Yes. Is are there certain foods that help with lactation or hinder? There are. Um and you I don't know if you have like these cookies or something people talk about. They, yes. They're lactation cookies. Coo- lactation cookies, yes. There actually is a smoothie that I really like and recommend that has some of the same ingredients that people feel is a little bit uh, more palatable and tastes a little bit better. But yes, they do have the cookies available okay. as well. Um, when I was breastfeeding, which was, well, last one was 13 years ago, people would say, if your milk wouldn't come in, you should drink a beer. Oh, okay. Yeah. To relax. You yeah. can, a glass of wine or a beer is totally fine. Yeah. Okay. In France, so, I think they drink all day. I think they do. They just, they're just like, okay. So it's not, I mean, so that's a, that's a kind of a side note question about breastfeeding and drinking. You hear people talk about like pump and dump and if they're going to drink, you can drink this many and then you have to pump for this much. Is that actually a thing or is it all going? It's a great question because a lot of our moms love wine. Let's just be honest. Um, I would definitely double check all this with your OBGYN, but I think if you have a beer or a glass of wine, you're good. You can still breastfeed. Okay. But if you have more than that or you're feeling kind of drunk right. um, or really tipsy, <laughs> then you definitely want to pump and dump. Okay. And that way your baby doesn't get that alcohol. Yeah. So, but I think a lot of these moms there. have been waiting for nine months to have a drink. Yes. And they're like, my time is finally here. Yes. Uh, and then there, I think, comes a lot of shame in having a drink, especially uh, like from the, our online friends. I think it's fine. Okay. I think a drink here or there, you know, if that helps you relax and helps you enjoy, then you, now don't, you know, go on yeah. a bender yeah. with a exactly. newborn. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know? like, you still have to get up the next morning or through the night right. with your newborn baby. Right. Okay. But a glass here or there, I think it's, I think it's delightful probably yeah. for most moms. <laughs> Is breastfeeding the most common struggle you see? 
In new moms? Sleep deprivation and breastfeeding. Sleep deprivation. Yeah. yeah. And breastfeeding. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So again, back to social media, mm-hmm. they see these glamorous pictures of people breastfeeding and it is hard. It's yeah. a hard, for most people, it's it's a hard thing to do. And so what I highly recommend, you can take a breastfeeding class beforehand, but what you definitely want to do is be proactive and make sure you're going to be getting help once you're home from the hospital. Okay. Um, I have several lactation nurses I know here in town who will come to your home. Even if you think things are going great, it's good for them to check in. They can check the latch and make sure everything's going smoothly, but to make sure you have hands-on help when you get home. Is that like a public health service or that's a, you would pay for that separately? As far as I know, it is a paid for separately. The lady that will come to your home is out of pocket, okay. but they do have breastfeeding clinics at certain hospitals that are free. But I think it's personally to. nice to be in your home, in your environment and have yeah. someone come to you. Is it realistic to think you have <laughs> mastered breastfeeding in the 48 hours that you're at the hospital? No. Okay. <laughs> it, you, no. You can um, be going along smoothly and then like what kind of things can go off the rails when you get home? Yeah, so a lot of things can happen with breastfeeding. Uh, sore nipples, I'm sure everyone's heard everyone's horror stories about how painful yeah. it can be. <laughs> Low milk supply, engorgement, mastitis. There is a whole list of really terrible things that can happen, but the good news is the people who suffer with all of those, mm-hmm. they either don't get help or yeah. they get improper help or they get a lactation mm-hmm. nurse who isn't, you know, great for their right. great fit for them. So if you get proper help, you can kind of iron out all those issues. And usually within two or three weeks, you kind of got your sea legs and you're kind of trucking in and in a groove with breastfeeding. Yeah. So help is available. Okay. Um, it's, you don't have to suffer through it or have any pain. You can ask for help and, okay. and get all those issues sorted out. Do you ever have women who it just doesn't work for them? Yes. Yeah. Some people just don't like it and that's okay. okay. Yeah. I have several friends who maybe they tried to nurse their first child. They weren't a huge fan of it. So second baby got no breast milk and they go straight to formula and that's totally fine. What happens to your body after you give birth, if you choose, like you're just, you are not breastfeeding from minute one. You're going straight to formula. What does you, like... What happens? Does yes. it come in or? Your, your milk can still come in. And then so you have to have like a drying up process, which is a process. You yeah. can use cabbage leaves and there's all kinds of different things you can do to dry up your milk. But a lot, there are several moms who don't want to breastfeed and that's totally fine. Yeah. I always And I'm a huge breastfeeding advocate. Mm-hmm. I will do whatever I can to help a mom breastfeed if that is her goal. But I always say, take a step back. Let's step back. Your mental health is most important. Mm. And look at a classroom of kindergarten children and yeah. tell me who is breastfed. <laughs> yes. I, you, don't, you can't tell. Yeah. So, why do you think there's such a judgment of, oh, I, because there's even a judgment like, great, we're all happy you're breastfeeding. Oh, not that long. That's right. way too long. <laughs> or that was way too early. Why do you think yeah, there's I, such a judgment? I don't know why everyone has their their judgments with everyone opinions. else. strong opinions. <laughs> yeah. It, there really does seem to be such strong opinions there on are. breastfeeding. There are. With motherhood in general, it just seems like there are a lot of sharks out there online. Yeah. Um, I, just do you, you yeah. know, put the phone down. Right. Follow your gut instinct. Follow what helps your mental health. Again, mm. I feel like mental health for a new mother trumps everything. It trumps mm. breastfeeding. You know, you do you what makes you happy and what makes you enjoy your newborn because yeah. the newborn phase goes by so fast, mm. so, so, so quickly. So whatever that looks like for your family to be able to like enjoy and love that time is yeah. what's most important. How long is it? What is the newborn phase technically? Um, I'm going to go with birth to three months. Okay. That's so that is a experts. really short, yes. most people probably don't remember a lot of that right. time. It's brutal. <laughs> yeah. It's just survival. At it's this survival, point. <laughs> but it is short yeah. and it does go by yeah. fast and they eventually will sleep through the night. Yeah. You know, you, and and get you, easier. In the moment, you never believe that. Like right. you never believe, you think you got the one baby that will never yes. let you sleep. You know the quote, what is it? Um, the days are long, but the years yes. are fast. Yes. Something like uh, that. It's very true. Yeah. The Yeah. Yeah. Or you're right. You're right. To that yes. effect. It's yeah. so true. It is so true. Because I feel like the longest day. Mm-hmm. And I think too, when you have, when I was having babies, you just had friends and I went to, my first in reality really never cried. He was angelic. The next three. He's the bait and switch baby. (laughs) Yes. The next three totally. But my first one never cried. And I'll never forget. I went to like a baby shower, a wedding shower for someone else. He was maybe two, three months old. 
And someone else was there with the exact same age baby and her baby cried the entire <laughs> shower. And I felt like I should just like pinch mine to make him cry because I felt so bad. And the mother-in-law uh, said to me, does your baby never cry? And I was like, oh gosh, sorry. And this other mother just looked like just ragged, like just run down ragged. And her baby ended up having colic was what Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we speak about we can't talk about speaking about that? It's a real thing because I think there's a lot of people who are like, no, that's not a real thing. So this is just my own opinion. Mm -hmm. If your baby screams all the time, something's wrong. Okay, that's not normal. Right, there is something going on. So we need to figure out what's going on, and there can be a list of things. And that's like an inconsolable. They're just not consolable. Yes, when they when your baby's crying all day, Mm -hmm. you know, high pitched, nothing you can do, nothing you will do can stop it. There's something wrong. Yeah. A baby should not cry that much. Okay. Um, so we can help troubleshoot that. Um, some of the issues I have personally seen, number one is if your baby has a tongue tie. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. My it's first had new. a tongue tie. Okay. And he got it clipped and he nursed like a there champ, but he couldn't nurse until then. Yeah. And he was a happy baby. Yeah. So what that is, without going into too much detail, but um, your tongue has certain ligaments and some babies are born in the ligaments Um, are too tight and Mm -hmm. they cannot latch on a breast or bottle properly. So when they are eating, they get air in their belly. And so it, they continually mm-hmm. get the air in their belly, which makes them Because they're not latching properly. Because they're not latching properly. So the fix is a tongue tie revision. Okay. And is that something though, like a pediatrician would find um, or a lactation expert? So I personally have seen pediatricians and lactation consultants miss a tongue tie. Can and a mom find it? Like, is it you, easy to, if you are looking for it? You can, but what I recommend there in a, wherever you are in the world listening to this, you could Google in your area. Um, here in Nashville, there are pediatricians pediatric dentist that specialize in tongue ties. Wow. So they will do a consultation and assess your baby. And they are, you want that person that does that every day, all day yeah. and looks at tongues all day. Yeah. And they will assess that. And if your baby has that, they can fix it. And the one here in town that I prefer, she does a laser revision. So it's mm. actually pretty painless. Um, so once you, as you're, as you're talking about with your son, once you get that tongue tie fixed, then they're happy. They don't have the air in their belly. So that's one of the reasons for colic. Um, Another thing is if they have a dairy intolerance. So um, if you're giving them formula and they don't do well with cow's milk, you may need to switch to a goat's milk formula. Or if something you're eating while you're breastfeeding is affecting their belly. Um, Yeah, like if they have a lactose intolerance and you're eating dairy, that that could be it. Okay. Yep. Um, Another thing is some babies need chiropractic care. So sometimes Mm -hmm. from delivery, they have like a painful neck or back and they can't tell you that. So they're crying because they're in pain. So there are several reasons why a baby would have colic. Oh, reflux is another one. I had a family Mm -hmm. with twins who the babies just would not sleep. They were constantly fussy. We got them reflux medication and then they were totally fine. So that's an actual medication they would take. That's not a food thing. Nope. It's basically like heartburn in adults. So Mm -hmm. it's painful for them. They don't rest well. And it's a liquid medication your doctor can prescribe. Do you know that because they're like throwing up? Is that acid reflux? Yes. They are spitting up and they just won't sleep well and they're Mm -hmm. fussy a lot or, you know, fussy all the time. Because it's like burning. Correct. It's like when you lay them down, they have heartburn and they're like, ah, you know, this hurts and they can't tell you. So they cry. So anyway, with colic, Yes, I've seen families with colicky babies, but usually there is a reason. Mm -hmm. And usually if you get to the root of the reason, you can fix, just like with your son, had a tongue tie, y'all fixed it. He was great. Um, But again, going back to also getting the proper help and the proper person to point you to the right direction is yeah. very critical. In all yeah. of this, so. Ours, he was in the NICU, even though he was full term, he was in the NICU and he wouldn't latch. And it was actually one of the nurses when I came in and she was looking at him and she was like this older lady and she said, well, that's because he's got a big old tongue tie. And I was, I didn't even know what it was. And she said, oh, we'll just, she said, we'll take care of it later. And I said, okay. They didn't ask us for anything. And then I came back and he was gone <laughs> and they brought him back in and there he was. And I, they just clipped it. They and clipped I it. think I said, what did you use? And then I think I didn't want to know the yeah. answer, but yeah. he was a new child. Yeah, I mean, it really, it made any difference. But if she hadn't, she was the first one that saw that. Wow. And it wasn't while he was breastfeeding. She just was looking in his mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It can, we can have babies where no one picks up on that. And yeah. then the family doesn't know. Right. They have no idea what's going on with their baby. If so. a baby is tongue tied, can they bottle feed? They can, but they also still may have an improper seal and can okay. still get the air. But yes, they can. Okay. All right. Yes. If, 
someone <clears throat> is wanting to breastfeed, but they also want to be able for their baby to take a bottle, whether it's for the freedom of somebody else taking care of the baby in the day, if they have to go back to work, yep. how quick do you recommend yes. so that they're not just like breast only? Yes. And that's a great question. And most of our moms do want to incorporate a bottle at some point, mm -hmm. because if not, like you're mentioning, I'll have a mom call and she's like, hey, I have a seven month old that will not take a bottle and I'm tied to my baby and I can't go out of town and yeah. I can't go to work. So I think it's important to implement a bottle, but what you want to do, it's kind of a, a system that we use here, but usually around two weeks old is when you can start the bottle feeding process mm -hmm. and, and pumping. And I can give more details on that if anybody wants it. But another thing that's really important is making sure you have the proper bottle there are a lot of bottles that are really fast flow. So if you give a baby that bottle, then try to get them back on the breast, they won't latch as easily. Oh, okay. So my preference is it's called the Dr. Brown's bottle with the preemie nipple, and it's as slow as a breast. So all of our clients use that bottle. And Even they, if you don't have a preemie? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's just a very slow flow nipple. So all of our clients use that, and they actually have all done great between breast and bottle mm -hmm. with that particular bottle. Yeah, I do remember yeah. that sometimes trying to give them a bottle, and then they almost choke, right. too, if it's too fast, because right. it's come at them like... Too fast. Okay. Guzzling. Do you have a, is there ever a fear that they're going to just wean themselves basically because they prefer the bottle? Um, we haven't, I have not seen that issue with this particular bottle that we use. Okay. All of our babies still go back and forth really easily. Okay. Yeah. What about the, I know like my mother and mother-in-law, grandmother always used to say to get them to sleep, put a little bit of rice cereal in their bottle at nighttime. Yes. Thoughts I actually, on that? well, I don't, we don't do that anymore. I actually okay. remember when I was younger, babysitting a little baby that we would do that with. We had a bottle that had like a rice cereal hole and we would give her this bottle of rice yeah. cereal. So I remember doing that as well. Um, with the age of baby that we deal with, zero to three months, we don't do that. Okay. So beyond that, I don't know. I would ask your pediatrician. Yeah. But for what we do, we just do breast milk or formula. Okay. Yeah. Feeding baby to go to sleep yes. versus putting the baby down awake because yes. it's so easy to feed them to sleep. Are we creating terrible habits by doing that? It can become a terrible habit. So what I recommend is if you're feeding your baby, whether it's breast or bottle and they fall asleep while mm -hmm. you're feeding them, then they have now connected in their brain that feed means sleep. Mm -hmm. So you want to break that you want to break that. Like what, ASAP. Correct. So mm -hmm. what you want to do is once you're done feeding, you want to do a diaper change or just kind of gently wake them up just so they're a little awake and drowsy, then lay them down in their crib or bassinet so that they are putting themselves to sleep. Okay. So they are connecting. I put myself to sleep, not the breast put me to sleep or the bottle put me to sleep. Okay. Yes. And always swaddling to go to bed. I personally, yes. I swaddle the baby every single time they're asleep. Um, daytime and nighttime with the sound machine. And again, that will start to train them that when they're swaddled and hear that little sound machine, yeah. they'll put themselves to sleep. Do you just use like an actual blanket or I've seen like the ones that they're like the swaddle blankets that have like the Velcro clips or do you just, like, you just do it yourself? So you can use a blanket. They are easier to kind of break out of those blankets and they now oh. have a whole line of new baby swaddles. Probably, I don't, you probably didn't have these when your kids were little, but um, a lot of them have the zips and the Velcros. I personally like the Ollie brand or the Halo brand. Mm -hmm. They're just really user friendly. You can get them really good and tight. Okay. So they're in there, they're really tight and good. Another thing, the tighter they are, they're going to sleep a longer stretch. If mm. they're loose, they can move their little arms and wake yeah. themselves up. So you want them in a good swaddle, pretty tight. Okay. So the swaddle sacks are a great option for okay. that. What about, I feel like I've seen um, those, like they're like weighted, uh, I don't know if it's like a weighted blank. It's like a weighted sack almost. Those are new. Okay. Yes. So they have several brands of those. And my personal opinion from the families that have used those, mm -hmm. again, you would need to check with your pediatrician on that. But everyone I know loves them. They'll mm. call me and be like, my baby just slept eight hours. Wow. So it's kind of like us sleeping with a weighted blanket. Right. So all I've ever heard are wonderful things about those. Okay. But again, I would make sure you yeah. are. Oh, well, I think, are they for doctor. older babies? They're not for newborns. You can actually use them with newborns. Well, you can. They have different sizes. So, so you, yeah. You could swaddle them right up, then put them in the weighted sleep sack, then put the sleep machine on and they'd be. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Except then you'd have to wake them up in three hours so you could feed them. Right. So you'd be like, oh. Um, okay. The one 
Other thing I wanted to ask you about breastfeeding is, well, you had said about the pumping. So how do we, if we're going out to, I keep saying we are like I'm breastfeeding. <laughs> if someone is going out to an event, how do they know, should they pump, should they not pump to kind of keep themselves on track? Okay. So when you feed your baby, it's usually every three hours. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to be gone longer than three hours, you're probably going to have to pump at some point. If not, your breasts are going to be full and it's going to be uncomfortable. However, they need, they now have a really cool new pump. There are mm -hmm. two brands. Um, one is the LV, one is the Willow, and they are hands-free. You literally put them down in your bra. There are no wires. There are oh, wow. no tubes. And you don't even really know that. No one can really even tell that they're, you know, in your bra and they will pump for you and you can be hands-free. So those are a great option if wow. you're out and about okay. needing to go to an event. Okay. Um, so yes, you would need to pump if yeah. it's longer than three hours. Okay. You won't mess up what you've, like your cycle or whatever. No, you okay. shouldn't. Okay. Uh, one time off is not going to mess anything up. Thoughts on letting our babies take their naps on us. Okay. So the best part of a newborn is holding and cuddling yes. a newborn baby. Yeah. However. And everybody wants to hold your baby. Right. However, you don't want to hold your baby so long and, you know, for so many hours that then they will not sleep on mm -hmm. their own. We actually had this happen with one of our uh, families, yeah, actually one of our Preds players, um, the baby was sleep trained. He was doing great. Then all the grandparents came in town, held him all day. And then oh, yeah. he, the mom was like, he won't sleep. Yeah. So I like to use the 40%, 60% rule. Okay. So during the day, when your baby is asleep, you can hold your baby 40% of the time. That they're asleep. Yep. Okay. So that's cuddling, rocking, holding, you know, skin to skin, wearing them. 60% of the time you want to have them in their crib or bassinet. Okay. That way they don't forget how to lay down on, you know, mm. on their own, but you're also getting to love, love on your baby. Okay. All right. I like that. The 40, yeah. 60. Okay. So speaking of sleep, um, you were saying the second biggest complaint, not a, not a complaint. I mean, it's a real thing other than breastfeeding is sleep deprivation it's for major. probably not just mom, but also dad, if they're waking up in the night. I mean, is there anything you, aside from having somebody help you in your home, if a mom is on her own, I mean, what is, she, what is she doing to try to feel human? Yeah. So I know everyone says it, but it's so true. Sleep when the baby sleeps. Mm -hmm. If you can even just get like one nap in during the day and then starting good sleep hygiene. I hate to say sleep training, but... Yeah, when you say sleep hygiene, I feel like you mean give them a bath before right? bed. Right? I was like, wait, what are we doing? With, okay, brushing their hair. That's a great question. Uh, just making sure that every time you're putting them down, you're doing the same things. Okay, with... so that's what you mean by hygiene. Right. Okay. This has nothing to do with how they look or being clean. No, but okay. that's a great question. Okay. <laughs> um, so starting day one home from the hospital with your sound machine in your swaddle, and I'm very business-like about that. Yeah. And then when they're awake, they're out of their swaddle out yeah. of the, and the sound machine is off. If you will start that, that really helps them okay. sleep good stretches for mm -hmm. you versus being up all the, some babies you'll hear or, you know, hear, you'll hear about that they're up a lot. Um, so you want them to have a good long sleep stretch so that you can in turn have a good sleep stretch in between feedings right. as well asking for help. If you can get anybody to come over and just give you a break once a day, if mm -hmm. like your spouse is at work and you're home alone with a newborn, if you can get a neighbor or a friend or a grandparent or a babysitter or anybody to just come over and hand that baby off for even just an hour so you can get a shower, nap, just have some quiet calm yeah. to yourself and not have to worry about the baby. It's so helpful yeah. to like, you know, fill your cup and have a little time for yourself. It's yeah. pretty critical. Especially though if you have other kids at home too. Right. Yes. Who baby goes to sleep and now you're on duty. And it just, yeah. I mean, I, I really do think it just is what it is. It is part of the process of having a baby and it does get better. Yes. It really does. I think the shocker with the first baby is that it's 24 seven. Yeah. Like everything you've ever known, you've yeah. walked out of work, <laughs> you can, you know, take a break from uh -huh. your spouse, you can drive. But with a newborn, you cannot, like my, one of my friends said the other day, you can't give it back. No. You know, like there's no return policy. This is it. That, that is, 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 is your a baby. daunting yes. yeah. feeling to yeah. be like, I am responsible for this thing yeah. forever. Um, so that takes a minute to kind of digest as the weeks go by, but it does get easier. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. And also I think you, on your first one, you've everything is new. Everything is a learning curve. Everything is, is this going to work? Versus like your second one, you're like, okay, I got this. Right. I know, <laughs> I know they'll be fine if I don't go right now to pick them up out of their crib. But your right. first one is just, everything is so overwhelming. Right. 
So in America, maternity leave is six weeks. Not long. Not long. <laughs> yeah. So when a mom is going back to work, I mean, are you're out of the house by this point. Or do you ever go back? Like if, if the transition happens to say daycare or someone comes into the home and it throws everything off, do you ever get to go back? And how? Sometimes, yes. It just depends on the family. Like okay. we, and we have some families, like right now we have a mom who was trying to wing it on her own for a few weeks and she was like, I definitely need help. So we've come in and her baby's a little older. We're doing some daytime help there. Mm. Um, so repeat your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, just, I'm just saying like, I guess it's like you have six weeks. That if, if maternity leave in America mm. is six weeks. In Canada, it's a year. I had a year right. off. Uh, that's, it's a good amount of time. You really feel like you've got your group by the time you go back to work. I cannot imagine at six weeks postpartum packing <clears throat> up and leaving for eight to 10 hours a day and taking your baby to daycare or having someone come into the house and all the, the emo I mean, the emotions that would come along with that as yes. well. So I guess like my question was, at that six weeks, you've gone along. You're like, oh, look at me. I'm in my motions. Yeah. Maybe I've got a little bit of a routine. And all of a sudden, it's disrupted. Is there, are there ways you kind of just keep that? Like for, and I guess my routine means more for sleeping and eating. Yes. So that's a great question. And this actually happened with a friend of mine. Um, she actually went, she's going back to nursing school with a brand new mm -hmm. baby. And so she had to trial. She started with a daycare. It didn't quite work out for her. So she actually got a nanny to come into her home. But sometimes it's trial and error. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to kind of play around with what's going to work best for your family. And as a matter of fact, to kind of start down another rabbit hole here, but I used to work at Vanderbilt Hospital years ago. And when I worked at Vanderbilt, we had people um, that were patients there from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So we would see people from Africa or China and Middle East. And a lot of those families have major support for weeks and months after delivery, mm -hmm. like you're talking about in mm -hmm. Canada. They don't go back to work at all, or they, you know, six months down the road, they'll go back to work. Well, here in America, they're like, put your high heels back on yeah. in six weeks, get it together, yeah. you know, put your makeup on. Yeah. And, and it's our postpartum depression and anxiety rates here in the U.S. Mm. are astronomical. And I think a lot of that is because there's this hustle yeah. and the mentality of get back to work. Yeah. Um, get your body back. Get your body back. Get your heels on. Get yeah. your briefcase. Get back to work. Yeah. So remembering that during your pregnancy and pre-planning, mm. another thing I can't stress enough is you have to plan for your postpartum time. Like so many moms plan for the birth and yep. they do all these labor classes yeah. and labor, labor, labor. Well, that's one day. Yeah. Postpartum is weeks and months and you have to plan. You have to plan for what that's going to look like for your family. You need to plan for if you have a history of anxiety or depression, it is most likely going to get a little worse after delivery. You need to plan for your nutrition, plan for sleep and after doing this again for 18, 20 years, I've realized people need more help than they think that they mm. will. A lot of moms think, oh, I got this, but then they break They break, and they right. call me. I get emails all the time at three in the morning, like SOS, we need mm. help. We didn't think we would need help. So making sure you're patting yourself and planning for if you do go have to, if you do have to go back to work in six weeks, what are your plans going to be for that? You need right. to have a plan. Like for care for the baby? Yeah, for yourself, yourself and the baby. Okay. You know? if So if somebody has history with anxiety or depression, do they have a higher chance of getting yes, postpartum? They, they do. do. They do. It usually exacerbates and gets worse after delivery because of the hormone shift and the sleeplessness mm. and the newness of the newborn and all those things. And it usually levels out after about six weeks. Um, but if you do have a history, and even if you don't have a history, you can, that can come up. So not to scare anybody, but definitely have that on your radar and yeah. pre-plan. There are great resources here in Nashville. Um, there are several um, companies and agencies and therapy groups that help specific to moms that are postpartum mm. that are wonderful. So. If we know somebody who's had a baby, uh, whether it's someone in our family, like our sister or niece, something like that, or if someone's listening and their daughter's had a baby, what are some signs that they can look for in the mom who's had a baby? Because like you said, the mom might think, I'm fine. I've right. got it all together. Yeah. Are there kind of, are there telltale signs or is it more sneaky? So usually the mom sometimes they don't even notice that they have anything going on, like you mentioned. But if so, they usually don't feel like themselves. Mm. But usually the spouse or partner is the first to notice. And with depression, um, they 
have a loss of interest. Maybe they don't they don't want to hold the baby or they don't mm. want to be interactive with the baby. Or on the other end, anxiety. We have some moms who won't sleep. They're constantly cleaning, constantly. They, they won't rest. They won't sit down. So you can kind of have it all over the spectrum. It can look like a lot of different things. But basically, if that... Um, mom just isn't herself, then you definitely need to reach out and ask for help. And there are several forms of treatment that can be extremely helpful for new moms and, um, you know, help them heal and be able to thrive with their newborn. Okay. Someone I know was telling me that they knew someone who had postpartum and it came out in the form that she constantly thought something was going to happen to her baby. Mm -hmm. She was neurotic over the fact, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but she was consumed with the fact that she would leave the car and come in the garage and fear she left the baby Mm -hmm. in the car. Or she would put the baby down for a nap and come downstairs and then question, did I really leave them in the nap or did I leave them outside on the street? And that's pretty common you know, and the, I always tell moms, if you have anxiety, the good thing is it means you really care and love your baby, right. care about and love your baby. And it's very yeah. true. If you're that concerned, it's actually good. It's, yeah. it's you know, biological. You're worried about your child and, and their well-being. Um, but if it's so bad that it interferes with your mental health okay. and your well-being, then we need to get help for that. So if it's an interference. Yes. And is it medicine that they usually take? Usually what I have seen is a low dose, some form of antidepressant, okay. and usually it's temporary. Okay. So it just helps kind of get them over the hump um, until their hormones level out and they can kind of get their sea legs with a newborn. Okay. Most people do go on a low dose antidepressant, which seems to be super helpful for okay. most people. Yeah, because I do think a lot of times after someone has a baby, you'll hear people say, oh, it's just the hormones. Oh, she's so hormonal. Or a woman will say, oh, I can't stop crying. It's just the hormones. And so knowing the difference in it's just the hormones versus something else is, and is postpartum caused by your hormones just being completely out of whack? I think it's a combination. Okay. And for starters, most every mom has some kind of a breakdown at some point. I've yeah. been cried on. <laughs> sure. Yes, I'm <laughs> like sure you the have. Week. They're like, oh, well, probably they look at you too and they're like, oh, thank God you're here. Like, I can take a breath. Right. Yeah. So everyone has that one, I feel like, big cry of like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what have I got myself <laughs> into? That is normal. The like, ah, oh. um, the release. But if you have any kind of issues that just continue for weeks and you are feeling like, you know, you're not having, you know, correct thoughts or right. you're extremely anxious and it's interfering with sleep or you're very depressed and you're sleeping too much. Um, definitely. And again, usually the partner is the first to notice mm. in that case, ask for help for, for your wife, Yeah, you know? Yeah. So help is available. I always say help is available. Utilize it. We're in a country that has so many resources. Mm. There's no reason to sit and suffer. Um, definitely reach out for help. Are they ask, checking for that at your postpartum appointment or should they be? Yes. So the OBGYN will see the mom back in two to six weeks, depending on what kind of delivery that they had. And they will, you know, ask the mom how she's feeling. Um, our team also will kind of keep tabs on our clients. And if yeah. they seem like, we, I've referred a lot of our moms to counseling or therapy, and they have all thrived and really, really enjoyed mm. that process. Some, even with their spouse, I've had a lot of the husbands say, I was not prepared for my wife to be like this. I, I've heard that a lot. Not in a bad way, just, hey, I was ready for a baby. I was right. not ready for my, my wife. wife to I didn't. I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. And it scares them. as men. They don't know how to, they're, mm. they can't fix it. So therapy can be great for the couple as well. I've seen a lot of them go together to that to the yeah. therapy session um, or for counseling to help them thrive as parents. Yeah. Well, I love, and I I love that we're talking about it because I do think for a long time there was such a stigma about it. And I'm sure that there have been many women who have gone to their postpartum checkup and maybe not felt okay, but when they were asked by their provider said they felt fine because they thought that they should and they should, I don't know, tough it up and be a better mom. And so I'm, I'm, I am glad that I feel like it's talked about a lot more and that people are kind of on the, yeah. on the, if you have it with one, are you guaranteed to have it? Like if you have it with one, might you have it with another? Or does it, is it just case dependent? It, I mean, it can, it can be all over the map. I've heard some people have it 
really badly with their first and then not have it at all with their second or vice versa or not have it with either. It's honestly hard to tell how it's going how the chips are going to fall yeah. with all that. And one thing I just thought of a, another great resource, if you are embarrassed to talk about this with someone, one thing I've noticed lately on Facebook, there are a lot of new moms groups and you can make an anonymous post. Oh, So I think that's helpful. Oh, and it doesn't put your Facebook um, right, name? Oh. right. Um, on several of the groups I'm on, um, like I'm on, on a hiking group or, you know, foodies of Nashville, yeah. but you can get on there and make an anonymous post. Okay. So I guess if you're a new mom, you could find a new mom's group. And if you're struggling with something, maybe go on it with an anonymous post and mention what you're dealing with. And maybe some other moms can chime in and help you without you having to okay. expose yourself if that's an okay. issue for you. Okay. Do you have any favorite gadgets, like anything new and upcoming that you're like, and you don't have to say a brand, yeah. but even like an item, whether it's a yeah. swing or. They're actually, actually, I'll say a brand, um, not sponsored, but yeah. um, they're actually. <laughs> Maybe after this, you will be. Yes, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so being in Nashville, a lot of people here, as we're sitting in the music studio, a lot of people here are musicians. Um, they travel for a living and a lot of them take their babies with them. Mm. So there is a new stroller called the Duna. I've heard of this. And it's awesome. Okay. It is a car seat and a stroller. So it's fantastic mm. for traveling. You literally just push a couple buttons. Um, it's like a transformer and it turns into a car seat. Then okay. you push a couple buttons and it's a stroller. So it's great for getting in and out of, you know, taxis or Air Ubers airplanes, or vans, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great one. Okay. Um, what else? I'll be thinking on gadgets because yeah. there's so many. Well, I, I'll be when, thinking. When we had babies, it, the swing was, that was like the magical or the bouncy seat. And um, again, it's like you could go down a rabbit hole and your entire living room could be <laughs> filled with gadgets from what you see people recommending like on yes. social media. So I don't know. There is a little baby. It's not a swing. It's called a mamaru, And it's like a little chair you can put them in and it does like move and make little like the movements. Side to, oh, it's like the, it does like a circle, like yes. a swishy circle on most. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are super helpful yeah. um, to just even set your baby down and maybe yeah. grab a shower while you're watching them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's another good one, but I'll be thinking, cause there's so many out there. It's a loaded question. Okay. Well you can, the we, Duna we can, we can put them up. Yeah. And okay. I, the snoo, I would do the snoo, snoo for sure. Yes. Thoughts on a pacifier. Okay. So every baby is different. Some babies come out and never want a passy. Some mm. babies come out and want to suck on a passy all day long, even between feedings. It just depends on your baby. So if you have a baby, baby that doesn't want a passy, great. You got the, you got the you, easy so card. Do you try to introduce a passy? If they want one, yes. So you try and see if they want one. Yes. Okay. However, if mom's breastfeeding, you can interfere with breastfeeding with a passy. So mm. in that case, there's a whole system and routine that we do. We do a pacifier trial, see if the baby will then go back to the breast easily. And it's kind of a um, a little trial that we do. But you can offer a pacifier if they are interested. Okay. Yes. Favorite kind of, there's so many pacifiers. Yes. So the one I like, it's a really simple one. It's called the Philips Avent. Okay. It's just, you can get it Target, Walmart, yeah. um, Walgreens, anywhere. It's very simple. It's the best pacifier for breastfeeding moms. Mm. So that one's my favorite. Okay. We'll put all these up Okay. Um, on the screen because again, they walk into Walmart or whatever baby store they're at and there's a what? 50. Uh, yeah, <laughs> easily. And they yeah. can go, someone recommended me to this. And yes. um, I did love a pacifier, but the weaning is probably a little hard. Right. <laughs> thumb sucking. I guess they're not really sucking their thumb that early on, right? They they're can. Not. And the good news about a passy is you can take it away. You cannot take a thumb away. Yeah. So obviously. Yeah. <laughs> obviously you can't take their thumb away, but it's easier to break well, them not. with the pacifier versus the thumb sucking. So. Yeah. Oh, I love that. None of mine sucked their thumbs, but they did take the pacifier. And that was a little bit hard. We ended up, uh, we would cut the tips off the uh -huh. nipple Slowly. part. Uh -huh. So when they would suck on it, it was just like air and they would start chewing on it. And they'd say, it's broken. I'd say, it's broken. I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're How probably like need, yeah. They probably need therapy um, <laughs> for that. Um, okay, so the one thing I kind of wanted to finish with was if you're, if someone is listening right now and they are just like, I have never been because you speak about this too of families who there's no babies in the families. There's no nieces, nephews. They never babysat, but this mom, everyone's looking at her like you're going to be the best mom, and she's thinking. I've never even held a baby, which I'm sure yeah, you have women lot. who have never held a baby. And I think a lot of people are surprised by that, especially if they grew up with babies in the family or babysitting. Um, 
Where, what does she do for help? Your course? That's or a great question. Um, yes. So I have a newborn education course, which I'll get into in just a second. But yeah. when I teach that class, a lot of parents will kind of whisper. They'll be like, we've never held a baby. Really? We've okay. never changed a diaper. Wow. Like, that is okay. But that they're is whispering. what I'm here for. Yeah. Yes. They feel almost guilty yeah. about it. So it's pretty common, I okay. think. And people just don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, but we do teach a course here in Nashville. It is in person. Mm-hmm. If you are not in Nashville, it is online. And what that is, um, is we go over everything about newborn care you would ever want to know. Okay. So same you, thing online or in person? It's all okay. the same exact information. Okay. Yes. It's like a virtual, uh, online, they get to see what you're doing? Yes. So okay. online, it is a series of videos. Mm. The whole thing is about 90 minutes. Okay. In person, it's two hours. And we go through everything. And I'm, I'm a minimalist, so it's very simple. It's very yeah. straightforward. Forward. We go through swaddling, diapering, breastfeeding, bottle feeding, bathing, what to pack in your hospital bag, mm. um, sleep training, how to use your car seat, how to use your breast pump. So all just the basics. Yeah. And then you're good until delivery. It just yeah. helps you prepare. You, you do this course about a month before delivery. Okay. So it helps you get ready and prepare for your newborn. That would be a great baby shower gift. Yes. To gift somebody. It is. Do you have people do that? We do. Okay. I thought I just thought of that. We do. <laughs> and as a side note, with the online course, we have a community group on Facebook. Mm-hmm. So you have access to me for questions. So oh. it isn't just the videos. You actually get to interact with me once your baby's here if you want to. It's like a private Facebook. Correct. So you can ask questions or oh, troubleshoot I with other moms. love that. So it's an interactive type you, of And you thing. don't have to leave the house. You can like be doing it in your milk-stained... Yep. Pajamas yes. from home doing and, that. And some moms do. They said they'll sit in their chair with their newborn and rewatch the swaddling video. Okay, so that or, was going to be my next question. You can rewatch things as they arise. Yes. So with our online course, you have a year access to all oh. of our videos. So a lot of the moms actually, they the, the most popular video I've heard is the bathing video. They love to rewatch that once their baby's sent from the hospital. Mm-hmm. So they'll prop up their phone, cut on the bathing video, and actually do it with their baby alongside wow. the video. So that's helpful. That is such a great yeah. resource. And one other thing, I think I mentioned this at some point, but I think it's really important when you are doing your online research or digging for all of your baby questions to make sure that your source is an expert. <laughs> right. We have all these people online giving yeah. all their opinions about everything. Yeah. And they may be a mom, but they may be just be telling you their, you know, their story about what they did with their baby, but you want to ask someone who's dealt with 12,000 new, I've dealt with 12,000 newborns in my career. Right. So um, I think it's super helpful to have someone who's unbiased, who does this for a living, who mm-hmm. can give you the best advice when you are doing your newborn education okay. and research. Um, by expert, you mean someone with a medical degree for the most part? I mean, if possible, or just yeah. someone who's dealt with a lot of newborns. Okay. Um, like I have a friend who's a lactation consultant. She's not a nurse, but she's been doing it for so long. She's okay. a great resource. Yeah. So she's not a nurse or a doctor, but she's held a lot of newborns and helped with a yeah. lot of breastfeeding moms. So someone who's done this for a long time. Do you have moms who have <clears throat> chosen, we keep talking about coming home from the hospital and we yeah. didn't even mention if they decided to have a home birth. Do you ever have moms that have the home We do. Have a home birth? We do. One of my very first clients, I was there right after her baby was born with a home birth and and stayed with her for a couple nights and help them at home. So yeah. it is, that is not as common, but we definitely help moms yeah. who deliver in all different types of settings. Okay. So, um, One thing I wanted to ask you, and just kind of when I was thinking about the professionals, you hear a lot about, and I think like comes into part play with the fear of the new moms is, at least from when I was having babies, was SIDS. It was that like terrible word yes. that you hear about. And it's like every mother's fear that they're like, I'm going to go in and see if my baby's sleeping. Now there's those blankets that like you can put under mm-hmm. the the crib to like check their heart rate. I mean, which at some point, does it just not make you neurotic? Is there any kind of new information on how to, is it like, yes, lay so the baby? Yes, that is a fear to put your baby down and then they saw breathing. That is a very common fear. I even have it, you know, Mm -hmm. when I'm watching a a child, I'm constantly watching them breathe. There are different tools you can use now. Um, Again, not sponsored, but I will throw this one out there. There is a um, new thing called the Owlet. It's a little sock you put on your baby's foot and it basically tracks their oxygen level. Mm. So if you've ever had surgery, you know, the little red light they put on on your your finger, finger. Mm -hmm. that is the same thing on their foot. So it checks their oxygen levels and their heart rate. And God forbid, if the baby stops breathing, it will alert you. Okay. 
So I personally love that because it helps you have peace of mind and you're able to lay your baby down and then you're able to go to sleep too, knowing it will alert you if something happens. Now, are there... There are false alarms that has mm. happened, but I'd rather have a false alarm yeah. than okay. not use the outlet and have something happen to your baby. Do you recommend your parents take CPR courses? Should we all be taking those? Yeah, I think it's helpful to definitely have an yeah. infant CPR class. Yeah. Um, I do not teach that with my newborn education class, but they do have them. You can just Google in your area. I think it's really helpful for both parents and mm. grandparents. And the to piece, take a yes, CPR. anyone that's going to be caring for the baby. Yes. Yes, wow. just to be able to know what to do. God forbid, again, it's so rare that that would happen. But if that should happen, you would know what to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where can people find your course? Okay. So we have Instagram and Facebook at The Newborn Nurse. Okay. And if you go there, there are links. Okay. Um, and we'll put it all up on the screen. Yes. Links to the course. Yeah. And then, of course, just our website, thenewbornnurse.com. We yeah. have links there to the course as well. So. I, I love that course. And I I know I would have found that so helpful, even if it wasn't in person, just having that. Because I have, imagine how many times someone has on YouTube searched how to give a baby a bath. Yes. <laughs> and who knows who's showing you how how to bathe the baby. Right. So to have kind of you showing everything from your perspective and the aftercare of the Facebook group is just like that mom community, especially if you're someone who is like the first of all your friends to have a baby and you don't have anybody else to ask for. That's one thing that Facebook can actually be yes helpful for. I know when I do the in-home class, which is the same information as the online, but it's when I go into their home. Yeah. At the very end, it's almost comical now. I'll watch the parents will just exhale. They'll go, ah, really? we feel so much better. Yeah. Now. We're ready. Yeah. We're ready. We're- do they have to use you for the aftercare part to take the course? Okay. A so lot of our just parents do will do the course without using our in-home yeah. course. You can do either or. Then they'll have the baby and be calling yes. you. <laughs> Come help. <laughs> well, I so appreciate all of your, just like your tips. And um, I feel like the information highway is changing all of the time. So um, I think everybody will probably check out your page and follow along and tell everybody they know that's having a baby. I don't even have a baby and I love following (laughs) your page. And you'll post something and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. I mean, it doesn't affect my life at all, but I'm always so intrigued by it. And everybody loves a baby. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thanks. Thank you.